starting a, a short series on the Godhead. And uh, it, it's going to be quite informational and maybe a little less inspirational. So you may not necessarily be jumping out of your seat shouting amen and doing cartwheels or swinging from the chandeliers. Um, but I, I don't know, I, I'm a student of, of theology, I'm a student of doctrine, and, and I love it. And I think it's very important for us to understand the importance of doctrine because doctrine is what will save us. Doctrine is simply another word for teaching, a body of teaching, a set of beliefs that uh, every group has. And our teaching, our doctrine, we take purely from Scripture. The Word of God, the Bible, is our authority. It is our uh, go-to, as it were, for all of our beliefs and our practices. And when the Bible comes into conflict with culture, with tradition, then we have to choose to follow the Bible as opposed to, to uh, tradition. Okay? So um, it is very important that we understand uh, theology, that we understand doctrine and what the Word of God teaches us. And in particular, the very foundation of what we ought to be understanding is the Godhead or uh, the nature of who God is, okay? Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 15, uh, we know this very well. It says, uh, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay, so he instructs him to rightly divide the word of truth. That means we don't just take an isolated scripture and make an entire doctrine out of that one isolated scripture, even though it may, be, it may come into conflict with other passages of scripture. The beauty about the, the Holy Bible with its 66 books contained in two testaments, the old and the new, is that it all uh, is consistent with one another. It doesn't contradict each other. Okay, the Bible doesn't say one thing and then contradicts another. It, it may have a beginning of, of, a, of an idea that is not fully revealed, but later on in the Bible, it is completely revealed. Jesus Christ, for example, uh, it is prophesied in the Old Testament that uh, from the book of Genesis that the seed of the woman should bruise the head of the serpent. That is speaking prophetically of the Messiah who is to come later on. And then throughout the Old Testament, you see time and again prophecies or what's called messianic prophecies that are only given in part but are fully revealed in Jesus Christ. And they do not contradict one another. And so to rightly divide the word, that means we take the entire Bible. That if you find one portion of scripture that somehow it doesn't agree with other portions of scripture, then, then you've got to uh, conclude that your particular interpretation of that scripture is incorrect because it must go in line with scripture. And remember this. Students, Bible school students, Scripture interprets Scripture, okay? How you want to interpret Scripture, you use Scripture. And so uh, we have a whole Bible school subject on, on the oneness of God, which I recommend all of you to enroll. It's one night a week or one morning a week on a Tuesday. And if you want to know more about the Word of God, this is not an exhaustive uh, um, series. It's only probably going to uh, occupy two, two weeks. Uh, because there's so much to cover that it's impossible uh, to do in just two weeks. So I, I would urge you to, to join Bible school. Once you finish New Life classes, your Bible studies, you can join Bible school and you can know more of the Word of God. All right, so we need to take the whole Bible. And it's important that we study the Godhead. Okay, John 8 and 24. And I've got a lot of scriptures, so I'm, I'm going to be skipping some. But John 8, 24 tells us basically, if you believe not, Jesus said, if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Okay, so this fundamental belief is required for us to be saved, that Jesus Christ is he. The fundamental belief of his identity is of incredible importance. It is of eternal uh, importance. And then in verse 27, they understood not that he spoke to them of the Father. He's talking about that I am he, I am the Father. Okay, uh, Romans 1 and 20, the Bible says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. That's a powerful scripture. It's telling us that the invisible things of God are clearly seen by the created world. That when we look at this physical world, 
It gives attestation. It speaks to the character of the Godhead of, of this one true living God. That we don't have an excuse. Okay, so we can't stand before God on judgment day before his throne and say, oh, well, I never saw you. I never, you know, perceived you the physically. It says that we don't have an excuse. Every man in, in their heart knows that there is a God. But, but that chapter is in referencing to that the man suppresses that knowledge of God. Why? Because he loves sin. So we want to sin, therefore, I'm just going to ignore that there is a God. But all of us know deep down in our side, every human being has this understanding within them that they know that there is a God. That's why you look at every, every kind of civilization, every groups of people in history or even today, whether it's in primitive jungles in, in South America or it's in the metropolitans of, of Europe and the United States, people worship something. They're all worshiping something because we were created. Whether you're worshiping a stone or a carved wood, or you're worshiping, you know, money or whatever it is. We all have this desire to worship something beyond ourselves because God had created us with this God knowledge. The Bible says he has put eternity in our hearts in the, in the book of Ecclesiastes. All right. So um, we can understand uh, the Godhead. And the Godhead begins with a singularity that there is one God. Everybody say one God. There's only one God. The Bible says, in the beginning, God, singular. It's very clear that there was only one God from the very beginning. And in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, the Bible says that God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God, in verse 27, created man in his own image. In the image of God, created he him, male and female, created he them. So we were created in the image of God. So God looks something like us, or we look something like God. We were created in the image of God. And, and there is not more than one, there is only one God. Just like there's not more than one of you. There's only one Costa, there's only one Anastasia, there's only one Marvin, even though there are people who may look like you, they may even have your name, they may even, you know, try to dress like you if they want to copy you, but there's really only one you. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that just, I mean, just think about that for a moment. That's a mind-boggling thought that there is no other Mary Fennell in this world. They might try to dress like you, Sister Mary. They might try to you know, do their hair like just like you. They may have the same accent as you if they're from Tonga. I don't know. But there's nobody else just like we are individuals. We are one. There's only one me. And, and that in itself is a huge, uh, a huge, uh, uh, I guess, evidence or attestation to us in our hearts that we, if we are created as one individual, nobody else like us, that God must be in the same way, just the one being. Now, of course, we can't exhaust God. He's too big. You know, we can't know everything there is to know about God, but he has revealed certain characteristics and attributes, and in particular, when he became man and dwelt among us, we can understand those certain aspects about who God is. And so God is one, and this, he says, in creating man in his own image, there is a singularity of a creator. And we can see that from the very beginning, the enemy attacks this understanding of the one God. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 4 in the garden, the Bible says, The serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now one of the things that the enemy attacks and tempts Adam and Eve about is this idea that they too could be as gods. Once again, that is a, 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 an attack of contempt towards the idea of the one divine being. That there's other divine beings, namely Adam and Eve could have been that. So from the very outset, there was an attack on uh, the, the divinity and the oneness of God, as it were. 
And then we read throughout the history of the Bible how God caused a flood to come upon the earth and uh, saved only Noah and his family. And then uh, Noah and his family began to replenish the earth and they began to spread around the earth. And then it says in, Le in Genesis chapter 11, verse 4, that when uh, there was men, uh, the population of the earth grew. They said, the men that were of one language, the people of the earth that were of one language at the time, they said, let's build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make us a name. That word name is na the word in, in Hebrew is Shem, which is, uh, again, is alluding towards the name of God. They wanted to have the glory of God by reaching the top of heaven. Once again, uh, uh, undermining the idea of the, the, the God of creation. This is an affront to the identity of the one true God. And, and not that God is egotistical, but it, it's a reality. God is concerned about tr the truth of his identity, not because he's insecure like some teenage girl. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> Got to be politically correct now. <laughs> But because to worship a false god is to bring death and destruction upon oneself. God calls Abram out of the earth of the Chaldees, a place that was teeming with a multiplicity of pagan gods. And he calls them out to serve the one true living God. The children of Israel, when they were in slavery, in slavery in Egypt, God calls them out of Egypt. He begins to form their identity and gives them the Ten Commandments. He starts to form uh, them, teach them what to eat and what to wear, and, and they were going to have a different identity now. And he gives them the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, verse 2. Here's what the first one. He says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Then he says, you shall have no other gods before me. He says, there's only one God. No other gods before me. You shall not make unto you any graven image. That's why we don't... Uh, Make images as aware of anything in heaven and earth and bow down to it and pray to it or worship it. Because it says there very clearly, you shall not make any graven image and any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. And then we read the great uh, command of prayer that the, the Jewish people, the monotheistic, the first monotheistic religion called the Hebrews, the Jews, taught in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. This is what's known as the Shema. Or as the Jews would say, Shema. They don't pronounce the E. They just say Shema. We say the Shema. Shema is El Adonai Elohim Adonai Echad. That's my Jewish attempt. That simply means, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Okay, this is the foundational understanding and prayer that the children of Israel were taught, that there was one Lord. And if you look at that word, uh, the, the word for one in the original Hebrew, it means one. You can't divide it. Singular. The Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. And then he emphasizes that they, they, they need to teach this. Uh, and these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. And shall talk of them when you sit in thy house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. And you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them upon the posts of your house and on your gates. In Mark chapter 12, Jesus reaffirms this. He answered in Mark chapter 12, verse 29, he answered him, said, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Amen. So that is the first commandment given about the identity of God. It starts, the whole foundation and the basis of everything that we believe starts with who God is, that he is one. And then throughout the Old Testament, again, it's reaffirmed. Isaiah 9 and 6, it says there, it's a prophecy of the uh, a coming Messiah, or in the Greek, Christos, which means the Greek version of Messiah, which the word Messiah comes from the Hebrew word Meshach, which literally means the anointed flesh. 
the anointed body of God. God prophesied that he's going to have a body, that he's going to come as the Messiah, the Savior. And here in Isaiah 9 and 6, it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. It says that the son that's going to be born, a child that's going to be born, a son that's going to be given, his name will be the Everlasting Father. That's not a contradiction in terms, but it's a revelation of his character. Like me, I'm a son. I am a mother. Uh, you know, I have a mom, dad, and, but I'm also a father. And it's the same with the Messiah, that he will be the everlasting father. Not just the father, but the everlasting father. The mighty God. Okay, not a mighty God. The mighty God, singular. There's only one mighty God. And, uh, and so, again, uh, Isaiah has this revelation, understanding of the Messiah. Uh, in, in Isaiah chapter 44, verse number 6. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. Okay? Pretty clear, huh? There's no God beside him. Okay? Uh, Isaiah 44 and 8. Uh, the last part of that, he says, is there a God beside me? He asks the question. Yea, there is no God, I know not any. So he's reiterating, again, uh, other uh, passages in Isaiah, that uh, Isaiah, 44, uh, Isaiah 45, 5 to 6, Isaiah 45, 15, 21, Isaiah 45, 21 to 22, Deuteronomy 4 and 35, 1 Kings 8 and 60, Joel 2 and 27, all affirming the oneness, the absolute indivisibility of the singular one God. Amen. And so with that understanding, we come into the New Testament and see again that the New Testament has not come to contradict the Old, but the New Testament is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. Otherwise, uh, we might as well just tear off the Old Testament part of our Bible and just stick to the New Testament. Of course, we don't do that because we believe that the Old and the New Testament go hand in hand. They confirm one another. They fulfill each other. And, and it is not a contradiction but a fulfillment. Jesus said, I didn't come to condemn the law or contradict it. I came to fulfill the law, he says. And so here we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse number 4. Uh, just a portion of that it says, there is none other God but one. Okay, Ephesians 4 and 4 to 6. Ephesians 4, 4 to 6, there is one body, one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Okay, there's only one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Again, Paul uh, emphasizing to the Ephesian church that there's only one God. 1 Timothy 2 and 5, there is one God, one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. And James 2 and 9 tells us that you believe that there is one God, you do well. The devils also believe and they tremble. Amen. And so the Bible tells us that in the fullness of time that God uh, became man. Okay, we know the story, the whole story of Christmas is about God coming into humanity. God became man and dwelt among us. Okay, let's go to some scriptures for the sake of some references. Uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 35. Luke 1 and 35, it says, And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing shall be born of thee, shall be called 
the Son of God. So God, in His promise in the Old Testament that He would bring redemption to humanity, He visits a young girl, a virgin by the name of Mary, and, and by the Holy Spirit impregnates her by a supernatural means. And she is pregnant with this child who will be called the Emmanuel, or God with us. That's what Emmanuel means. And that supernaturally he is uh, conceived and then is born and he's prophesied again. Where is my scripture? Uh, Matthew chapter 1, verse number 20. Again, it says, but while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. You see, Joseph was, was going to divorce her or, or, or not go through with the, with the marriage. He was a spouse or engaged. And when he found out that she was pregnant, you know, and, and he was a, a good man, he didn't want to make a public display of her, but was going to just separate from her privately. But then he has this dream, and the dream, the, the angel speaks to him, says, Joseph, don't be afraid, because that which is uh, in her, that shall be born of you, uh, in her, is con that's conceived in her, is of the Holy Spirit. It's not that she was with another man. It's conceived by miraculous way. God came into a woman, into her by the Holy Spirit, and she was born, and the baby was conceived and born. And in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, here it is again. Let me read you. The scripture, the narrative, he says, And she shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child. Uh, this is the prophecy from Isaiah. And shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Okay, this is where the three monotheistic religions differ. Islam, Judaism, is that God became a man. And Islam teaches there's no way God can become a man because it's a contradiction in terms, they say, that God can't be man. But why can't God become man? He, there's no limitation to the ability and the power of God. Of course, the Jews believe are still expecting a Messiah to arrive. They think that he hasn't come yet. But we say that he's come 2,000 years ago through Jesus Christ. And, and Islam teaches that uh, God can't become a man, but he's declaring in Scripture. The Word of God teaches us that God became man. In the beginning was the Word, John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word Logos in the beginning was the Logos. And the Logos was with God. And what was the Logos? The Logos was God. Okay, so in the beginning was the Word. The Word and, and God, you can't separate His Word from Him. He is His Word. The Word was God. And the verse 14, was the Bible says, And the Word, what? Was made flesh and dwelt among us. What's the Word? God was made flesh. And dwelt among us. He put on flesh. He put on humanity. He brought, and, and it's not a pseudo-humanity. He was fully man. And he was fully God at the same time. Okay. Uh, that's the mystery. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 16. First Timothy 3 and 16. Somebody want to read that for us? Louder, please. From, from the diaphragm. <gasps> and without controversy. <laughs> okay. So great without controversy, he says. There's no controversy about this. There's no debate, no argument. Great is the mystery of godliness. Okay, what's the mystery? That God was manifest in the flesh. In other words, we don't know how he did it. We know how we were all born, right? 
I said, the kids. But we don't know how God was manifest in the flesh. That's the mystery, how he became a human being. Now, you remember in the Old Testament when, when uh, Moses was in the wilderness and, and there was a burning bush that didn't burn up the bush and the voice came from the bush? It, that was the presence of God. The angel of the Lord was speaking through that. There was also another theophany called the, the priest of Melchizedek who appeared to Abraham and that was a representative of God. But, but God wasn't limited to those things, but he showed himself through those uh, theophanies or manifestations. Jesus Christ became the ultimate manifestation of God by becoming one of us. God becomes a human being. And this is what is so astounding about the story. And I know we've heard it over and over again being in church. But you've got to recognize and realize the revelation of God becoming a human being. And he was fully human. Because the Bible says he was tempted in all points like we, were, uh, we are, but uh, sin not. He never sinned. And so uh, God becomes man for, for the sole purpose, for the main purpose of dying for our sins. Okay, our sins uh, needed to, to have a payment, needed to have a, a kind of uh, a substitution, as it were, uh, for us. And that's why Jesus came. Only he was worthy enough to remove sin forever. Because up until that time, you know what the children of Israel did every year in Passover? They would sacrifice animals. They would shed blood of all kinds of animals and that would pay for their sins. But they had to do it every year. Once was not enough. Because the blood of bulls and goats, the Bible says, is, is not sufficient. But through the blood of an innocent, perfect, and holy man, our sins could be removed forevermore. Okay? Um, but that does not mean that there was two gods it's not jesus and the father but whenever it refers to the son of god as we had read you shall call him he shall be called the son of god it's in reference to god becoming a man okay whenever you read the son of god it's always in reference to god in in humanity that came two thousand years ago that was begotten through the virgin mary okay came into being and uh, that, that was at a point in time. But you will never see the term God the Son in the Bible. That's not in the Bible. It's always just the Son of God. Because the Son of God is in reference to God in human form, in humanity, in this human nature. Colossians chapter 2, verse number 8 it says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of man, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. So it's saying that in Jesus Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead in a bodily form. Okay, It doesn't say that Jesus is in the Godhead. It says that the Godhead dwells in him. And he is, and we are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. So all of God, the Bible says that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Okay, uh, and, and it is uh, it's quite an, an incredible thing to, to understand. He is the invisible God made visible. Colossians 1 and 15, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn or of every creature. You can't see God. The only way you can see God is through the image of God, which is Jesus Christ. He is the image of the invisible God. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1. God who at sundry times and in diverse manners, in different ways, spake in time past unto the fathers and unto the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, 
sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, uh, being made so much better than the angels. So he is the express or the immediate image of the person of God. So the only image, because God is invisible, the only image that we could see and behold of God is through the face of Jesus Christ. He is the image of the invisible God. That's why Jesus said, no man could, go, could inherit eternal life except through me. He says, if you would try to get into heaven in another way, you're a thief and a robber. He says, I'm the door. I'm the way, the truth, the life, exclusive, only way. And, and uh, it's only it's because he is God who had become man. And so um, I, I know most of you would believe, all, believe what I'm saying here today. This is it's scripture. Um, Jesus is the son. In John chapter 9, uh, verse 35, says Jesus heard they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord? John 9 and 30, uh, 36. Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? In verse 37, Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talks with you. He says, so do you believe in the Son of God? And when he's referring to the Son of God, you know, that's why they crucified him. Was because of blasphemy, because he claimed to be God. The, and, and the Jews understood all, for a, th- a couple thousand years, they've always understood that there's only one God. And, and God is declaring that, you know, there's no God beside me. Isaiah he says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. He's not all of a sudden coming to the New Testament and saying, ha ha, I, I fooled you guys. I was just kidding. There's actually three of us here. Now let me explain something to you. There are not three persons, but there are three manifestations of the one God. Remember, we're going by Bible. We're going by Scripture who attests in the indivisibility and the singularity of God, who manifests himself really in in three different modes in the New Testament. But if you look at all the Old Testament ways that he manifests, he showed himself in many different ways, in the pillar of fire by night and the pillar of cloud by day. Now, if you count all of those manifestations, you could say, well, there's a hundred gods in one God. No, there's only one God. Who showed himself, the Father, when he said to, God the Father is reference to God in creation. God the Son is not in the Bible. It's not, an, it's not a biblical uh, term. But when we say the Son of God in Scripture, it's referring to God in humanity, in redemption. And the Holy Spirit, again, uh, it's part of the one nature of God. But whenever the Bible talks about the Holy Spirit, it's always referencing to his activity within the physical and material realm, within, human, within the human realm, okay? But it doesn't mean that there's three of them. There's three persons. It's three modes or manifestations in the one God. Just like me, for example, right? Uh, I've, I've got different roles. I've got different modes. When I'm with my children, I, I, I don't, I, I talk to them as their father. I don't look at them as, I don't say, Kiana, hi, mom. I, you know, uh, she's not my mother. It's a different mode. And then when I'm with my wife, then I'm, I'm the husband mode. Uh, sometimes I'm the son mode. <laughs> with my parents, I'm the son. But am I three different people? No. I'm the one person. And that's what you've got to understand this revelation. And I'm going to show you historically where some of these changes started to come into being. Okay? Um, it, it's, again, another illustration is, is you get a glass of water. And then you put it in the freezer, what happens? When you put the freezer in the water, it turns to ice. Then you, you put it in the kettle, what happens to the water? It turns to steam. The three different components, but it's still H2O. It's still the same essence. It's, it's just in different forms. And that's what it's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is about. It is not three different gods. It's not like a God, when you get up to heaven, there's going to be a conjoined triplets on the throne. The Bible says there's only one sitting on the throne. And that's the lamb. The lamb is on the, sitting on the throne. Okay? So, uh, Jesus, he's also, not only is he the son of God, because he is God in flesh. Remember, the, the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily in him. That God was in Christ. God was manifest. Amen. And the word God was made flesh and dwelt among us. Uh, John 9, uh, sorry, John 14 in verse 17 to 18, it says, Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, 
because it sees him not, neither knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Okay, so the Holy Spirit is Jesus because he, he, t- he tells us later on in a few verses down that... Um, In verse 26 of chapter 14, in verse 14, uh, verse 18 of chapter 14, he says, I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. This is Jesus' words. Verse 26, but the comforter, there it is, it's the same word, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said to you. So he's basically saying, I am the Holy Ghost. We're the one. He says, the Holy Ghost or the Comforter, which will come in my name. The name of the Comforter of the Holy Spirit is Jesus. Okay, so uh, again, we're going to teach more. Brother Ben's going to teach more about this next Wednesday. So you've got to come back. Uh, but you've got to understand that when God was uh, manifest in the flesh in, through Jesus Christ, There is the two natures to Jesus. There is the divine nature and the human nature. Now, the human nature, he grew tired, right? He went to sleep. Now, does God get tired? No. The human nature, he grew hungry, right? And he ate. Uh, Of course, he went to the cross and he died. That's the human aspect of God. Now, can God die? No. So, who died? It's the man, Christ Jesus. There's one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. Jesus was fully man, like what you see me, and he was also fully God. When Jesus walked on water, that was God. When he healed the blind, when he opened deaf ears, when he multiplied the bread and the fish, when when he resurrected from the dead, he was God. But when he was beaten, when he was sore, when he was tired, he was weary, when even he was feeling anxious and exasperated, uh, that was his human nature. And so the key to understanding the Godhead is that there's two natures to God, the divine and the human. He had to be fully human, otherwise he wouldn't be a legitimate sacrifice. He can't be a fake human. You know how they have these uh, artificial intelligence now, these robots and you know, he wasn't some subhuman or a pseudo-human. He was fully human in order for him to be a legitimate sacrifice for your sins and my sins. Uh, but again, that, there's the mystery. How? We don't know. We don't have the science. When we get to heaven, we will know. But always understand that there's only one God, and his name is Jesus Christ. Every title that is attributed to God is also attributed to Jesus in the New Testament. He said, I am the first and the last in the book of Revelation, the beginning and the end. And and he says, I am the Almighty. And so there's only one Almighty. Okay, so uh, I just want to show you uh, that the the teaching of the Trinity is, is, again, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. Okay, the word Trinity is not scriptural. But it was uh, put there several hundred years after the early church in order to try and understand the mystery of this Godhead. But if you look at it, it's not, a, it's not from a biblical roots, uh, is this understanding of the Trinity. But in fact, it is from pagan roots, uh, as I will show you here. Uh, you see this, this is the triune divinity of the ancient Assyrian gods and also the, uh, the pagan Siberians believed in a a triune divinity of gods. There's threeness. Um, Next slide, please. Uh, Again, this is uh, depicting Nimrod and his wife, Semiramis, and their son, Tammuz. And this is all perverted stuff here. Uh, Again, but they were all considered gods, the three gods that they worshipped in in those pagan times. Okay, next slide. Uh, This is the the three gods of Osiris with his son Horus and his wife Isis. Again, this emphasis on three gods. Okay, next slide. And even in Hinduism, there's Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. And of course, in Hinduism, there's hundreds and hundreds of gods. Okay, next slide, please. And even Buddhism, there's the the three gods 
uh, the three bodies, as they, they call it, tri trikaya in, in, in Buddhism, which is the three bodies of Buddha. Okay? So again, you see this idea of, of threeness uh, in ancient uh, and, and other pagan understanding, other pagan religions. And so uh, Trinitarianism, in the essence, is the belief that there are three persons in one God. And they call these three persons the Trinity or the Triune God. And it's their attempt to try and understand the mystery. Because when you read the New Testament, it just talks, talks about the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And it seems like, oh, well, there's three different ones. But again, remember, it's three different modes. One God, three different roles. We never say, oh, I was filled with the Father. When somebody speaks in tongues, we don't say, oh, uh, they were filled with the Father or they were filled with the Son. They were filled with the Holy Spirit because that's the proper biblical terminology. Whenever God does something miraculous, it's always by the Holy Spirit. Now, the Bible says that God is a spirit and God is holy. So God, the Holy Spirit, is God. Okay? So it doesn't mean that there's the Holy Spirit and then there's God's Spirit, which is holy as well. So there's two other spirits. No, it's just the one spirit. It's the one God. And Trinitarianism is the attempt of trying to make it understandable, but in, in their effort to make it understandable, it's actually made it more confusing. It's actually created a threeness, a triune God uh, in, in their understanding. So the first person uh, that was a proponent of Trinitarianism, next slide please, is a guy by the name of Tertullian. Tertullian was the first person, and, and he lived from 150 to 225 A.D., so sometime after the apostles. But Tertullian was the first person recorded by history to use the word trinity, substance, or person. And he was the first to speak of three persons in one substance. Okay, so uh, Tertullian taught this, and uh, it wasn't actually uh, adopted until uh, several, uh, uh, quite, a, quite a few years have passed. And a guy by the name of the Roman emperor, by the name of Constantine, he has a vision of the cross. And all of a sudden, pagan Rome is changed to become Christian. But of course, it wasn't the pure Christianity that we read in the Bible. He had mixed Christianity with the, the uh, pre prevailing pagan religion of Rome at the time. And they, it became known as the Roman Catholic Church. Okay? And the Roman Catholic Church uh, had, had come to believe certain doctrines and then there was this argument uh, between about the identity of God, who God is. So Constantine, who said he was a Christian, but you know what? He didn't get baptized until just before he died. He got baptized on his deathbed. You know why he got baptized? Because he wasn't a true Christian. Because he wanted to keep sinning, do all the sin, and just before he died, he can get baptized so that all his sins can wa get washed away. And see, even they, he understood that baptism was important for salvation. But he, he didn't want to get baptized because he wanted to continue sinning. And even after he had his conversion, before he ba got baptized, he killed his own wife. He killed his own son. This is the father of the, the first pope, some would say, uh, really, of, of the, the Roman Catholic Church, which was the, the only church at the time because every other church was outlawed. There was only one state church, and that was the Roman Catholic Church. And so uh, there was this argument between uh, these priests by the name of Arius and Athanasius. Arius believed that there's, uh, basically believed in two gods, that Jesus was like a demigod. He's a, like a Jehovah Junior, a little god. And, and that's, you know, uh, churches like Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, Mormons, believe in, in Arianism. Okay, not, not in a complete classic sense, but they don't believe that Jesus was, was the god. They believe that he was just a, a little god. That's why if you ever get a Jehovah's Witness Bible, it's called the New World Translation. If you read John 1.1, 1, 1, they change it. They put, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And instead of saying the Word was God, they say, and the Word was a, little g, God, was a God. Because they wanted to show that Jesus Christ wasn't truly God. Whereas Athanasius, he believed in the threeness of God. And we, I, I guess they, they would call us... Um, um, uh, modalist or uh, monarchical, mono monarchical modalist, which is basically saying monarch. Monarch is one. Arch is, is king. One God who is in different modes. 
Okay, so we don't believe in the Arianism. We don't believe that Jesus is Jehovah Jr. But we also don't believe in the Athanasius understanding that there's three of them. You know, there's the God and, and like talking like the, like the three of us. You know, we're three different persons. That's what they're saying. The God is three different persons. We don't believe that. We believe that there's one God who revealed himself in three different ways in the New Testament. Uh, and that was uh, some of the proponents of that, of course, was Sibelius. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, a guy by the name of Origen, he also believed the same as, as Tertullian uh, in trying to understand uh, uh, the Godhead. Next slide. He was more from the West, uh, uh, west Side, Athanasius. Uh, he was the guy that really pushed through uh, the idea of, of Trinitarianism. But again, as I said to you, the, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. Um, okay, next slide. Uh, that's Constantine. He saw a vision of the cross. And he said, all right, we're all going to be Christians because they realized, you know, when before that they were throwing Christians in the Colosseum, but instead of Christianity dying out because they were killing them in the Colosseums, it was multiplying. It was growing. The more they killed Christians, the more people got converted. And so he said, no, stop the killing. I've had a vision of the cross, but he wasn't really a Christian. Uh, he was quite an evil person. But he was the one that said, all right, all of this arguing as Arian and Athanasius, we're going to have a, a, a meeting. We're going to have a big conference in Nicaea. We're going to meet together all of the priests, all the bishops and cardinals, and we're going to talk about this issue of the identity of God. Who is God? And of course, Athanasius won out against Arius, Arius and Arius was considered a heretic. And so the doctrine of the Trinity was officially adopted uh, from then on. Uh, not completely, it's developed over time. There was another, uh, another uh, council after the Nicene Council. There was the Council of Constantinople, which again reaffirmed this idea of who God is. And then they came up with the um, Athanasius Creed and then the Apostles' Creed. Uh, I don't have time to read into that, but the Apostles' Creed really uh, David Bernard writes in his book, this is a great book to have. If you guys have not studied the oneness of God, this is a brilliant book. Um, in the Apostles' Creed, it says that I believe in God the Father Almighty and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was born of the Holy Ghost, of the Virgin Mary. He was crucified under Pontius Pilate and was buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of the Father. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead and in the Holy Ghost the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body. So the creed was later revised to meet the challenge of new doctrinal issues. Okay, now remember that this was the Catholic Church. And there were many things that the Catholic Church began to institute in their teaching. In 300 AD, they started to pray for the dead. That means you can pray for, for your dead relatives. In 300 AD, they also started making the sign of the cross. Ever done that? Is that in the Bible? No. Uh, 375, they introduced the veneration of angels and dead saints. In 375, they also used images of worship. Uh, 394 A.D., the Mass was a daily celebration. In 431 A.D., the beginning of the exaltation of Mary, the term Mother of God was introduced and applied at the Council of Ephesus. Again, Mother of God is not in the Bible. Extreme unction, 526, doctrine of purgatory. Anybody ever heard of purgatory? It's like this uh, celestial lounge room that if you sin and you died and you were not a Christian, you can go to purgatory and make up for your sins and still go to heaven. Again, not Bible. A prayer to Mary and to the dead saints was introduced. You can pray to Mary. 600 A.D. this was introduced. You can pray to dead saints. Uh, you can worship crosses and images and relics, 78, 786. 995, the canonization of dead saints. They were made uh, holy. And, you know, if you're a saint, you're already holy anyway. In 1079 A.D., celibacy of the priesthood. Again, not biblical. It's not in the Bible that a priest can't get married. 1090 A.D., the rosary was introduced. And again, I'm not, I'm not attacking anyone. I'm simply reading facts, okay? I'm not, I'm not having to go with anybody. I was brought up in Catholic Church. Um, but this is, this, is, this is doctrine. This is truth. This is historical fact. The rosary was introduced in 1090. Indulgences at 1119, that means you can buy 
your sins, you, you buy indulgences, so that pays for your sins. When we know we're saved by grace. Transubstantiation was introduced in 1215 AD. That means that when you take the communion bread and drink, when you consume it, when you chew it and drink it, it literally turns into the body and the blood of Jesus in your body. That's what transubstantiation is. Is that in the Bible? No, the Bible tells us it's just to remember, to remember the sacrifice of Christ. Uh, I can go on and on. Adoration of the wafer, um, confession of sins to a priest, cup forbidden to people at communion uh, was introduced. Purgatory proclaimed as a dogma. On and on and on. And then uh, in 1545, just at the turn of the, the Reformation movement, tradition declared of equal authority to Bible by the Council of Trent. Did you hear that? It says the Catholic Church said tradition is just as authoritative as the Bible. So if you're following a tradition, it is just as much authority, even though it's wrong, it is just as much authority as the Bible. And you know, they still practice those same things today. And it's not in the Bible. It is not in Scripture. And there's so many, and that's the reason why we have so many other Christian denominations is because uh, they, there was a reform from this uh, twisted, erroneous, and an evil teaching. It's wrong. They said Martin Luther was the first guy. He said, no, we're saved by grace, not by indulgences, not by paying money. We're saved by grace through faith. And, and that's why we have the, the Lutheran church or the Protestant church, Protestant movement. They protested against the teaching of the, uh, the, uh, um, the pre predominant church, the Roman Catholic church at the time. So all of these things were changed. And uh, infant baptism also uh, was changed. Um, and all of, these, all of these Protestant churches came about because they protested against some of these teachings. And that's where we are today. We are one of the final reformations. Yes, we believe in the Lutheran movement that, that we are saved by grace through faith. We believe in baptism, but we believe that baptism is by the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. We, we don't believe in baptizing babies. We believe in dedicating them, but when they're at an age that they can understand, we can baptize them. We believe in, uh, in living holy, like, like uh, uh, John Wesley, who said that the holiness movement, uh, of the, uh, there's a method to our Christianity. We believe all that. And one of the other things that has not changed from this same perversion of teaching is the understanding of the Godhead, the Trinity. The word Trinity is not in the Bible. But the word of God tells us, declares to us, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And Jesus Christ is the manifestation of God in humanity. And you can't be saved without him. Praise God. Next slide. Is there another slide? I'm not sure. This is the Council of Nicaea. All the popes got together. And say, we're going to believe in the Trinity. This is what we're going to choose to believe. And, and from then on, virtually every church now has, believes in that. Except for uh, the, one of the other final reformations. Is a restoration of apostolic teaching of what the Bible says. Sola Scriptura. Bible alone. Is, is what brings us salvation and understanding of truth. It's scripture alone, not traditions of man, not because they've got the biggest church. The, the biggest church is the Catholic church still in this world, but they still, they teach a lot of stuff that's not scriptural. And we have to understand that there is only one God. Let me read something to you as we close. Um, this is not uh, from any kind of religious source, this is international uh, it's, it's an encyclopedia. In, in, International Standard Bible Encyclopedia acknowledges that Trinity is a second century, not, not first century when the apostles were around, is a second century term found nowhere in the Bible. The scriptures present no finished Trinitarian statement. It further states that church fathers crystallized the doctrine in succeeding centuries long after the apostles had passed from the scene. 
Martin Luther, uh, um, who was the German priest who initiated the Protestant Reformation, said, It is indeed true that the name Trinity is nowhere to be found in the Holy Scriptures, but has been conceived and invented by man. Martin Luther said that. Historian and science fiction writer H.G. Wells, in his noted work, The Outline of History, stated, There is no evidence that the apostles of Jesus ever heard of the Trinity at any rate from him. The HarperCollins Encyclopedia of Catholicism, Catholic Encyclopedia says, Today, says, however, scholars generally agree that there is no doctrine of the Trinity as such in either the Old or the New Testament. It would go far beyond the intention and thought forms of the Old Testament to suppose that a late 4th century or 13th century Christian doctrine can be found there. Likewise, the New Testament does not contain an explicit doctrine of the Trinity. And the Harper Bible Dictionary uh, states, The formal doctrine of the Trinity as it was defined by the great church councils of the 4th and 5th centuries is not to be found in the New Testament. Professor Charles Ryrie, uh, you're right for this? I'll give you a couple more. Uh, many doctrines are accepted by evangelicals as being clearly taught in the scripture for which there are no proof texts. The doctrine of the Trinity furnishes the best example of this. It is fair to say that the Bible does not clearly teach the doctrine of the Trinity. In fact, there's not even one proof text. If by proof text we mean a verse or passage that clearly states that there is one God who exists in three persons. He goes on to say, the above illustration proves the fallacy of concluding that if something is not proof text in the Bible, we cannot clearly teach the results. If, there were, if that were so, I could never teach the doctrine of the Trinity, he says. Shirley Guthrie, professor of theology at Columbia Theological Seminary, wrote, the Bible does not teach the doctrine of the Trinity, neither the word Trinity itself, nor such language as one and three, three and one, one essence or substance, and three persons in its biblical language. The language of the doctrine is a language of the ancient church taken from classical Greek philosophy. Remember, the Greek mythology had a multitude of gods, lots and lots of gods. And if the devil will attack anything, he will attack the identity of who God is. He knows the more he threw Christians to the lions, the more they multiplied. So he said, I'm going to do something else. I'm going to take a different approach. I'm going to do an inside job. I'm going to go in the church and begin to twist their teaching. That's why the apostles said in the epistles, he says, beware of false teachers, beware of false doctrine. He didn't tell them, oh, beware of scary demons that are going to scare the living. No, he warned them about teaching. It's teaching that will pervert. Why? Because a, a, a half-truth is a lie. Half-truth is no truth at all, and a half-truth will get you to hell. And so he's got, he got wise, he wised up, the devil wised up, realized the way that I'm going to attack these people is to turn their teaching into a perversion. Stop worshiping idols. Stop praying to Mary. Stop paying indulgences. Stop believing that there's more than one God. I, I have so many quotes here about how this is not, it's, it's pagan in its roots. And, and I'm not saying people who believe in Trinity are, are sinners. No, this is, just, this is just doctrine. Most people don't even understand the Trinity. You know what most, even theologians would say, it's a mystery. Don't even try to understand it. It's a blessed mystery. That's what we were taught as Catholics, as kids. It's, it's, a, it's a holy mystery you can't know about. But there's no mystery about the indivisibility and the singularity of the one God. Hallelujah. Let's all stand. I'd ask you questions if anyone had questions, but we don't have time for questions. We'll go into this again. Brother Ben's going to go into more detail about this next Wednesday. Uh, this, is, this is some awesome, interesting stuff. This is why we go back. And there's certain things we do in this church that a lot of churches don't do because we stand upon Scripture. We, we, don't, we don't click our fingers in worship. You ever notice that? Or we don't whistle in worship. Not that there may be anything wrong with that, but it's not in the Bible. So if it's not in the Bible, let's just stay away from it, just in case God doesn't like it. But let's do what the Bible, the Bible says to clap your hands, to shout. That's why we shout. That's why we dance. Dance, you know, uh, worship the Lord with a timbrel and with a dance. That's why we have instruments. It lists all the different types of instruments. That's why we baptize people in full immersion and we say the name of Jesus Christ, not in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. 
Because we have a revelation that the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost is what? Jesus is the name. That's why when you read the book of Acts and they baptize people, they didn't say in the name of the Father. They baptize them in the name of Jesus Christ. Well, so say, oh, some people say, well, that doesn't really matter. You know, God knows what we mean. Well, you might be right. I don't know, but I'm not going to take that chance. I'm not, I want to just stick to Scripture. I don't want to stick to, oh, let's make up our own doctrine, Brother Ben, Sister Helen, let's just make up our own teaching. There's a guy in the Philippines who calls himself the appointed son of God. He, he literally, is t he's got a following of tens of thousands of people, filthy rich, but he's claiming to be the son of God. And I'll tell you something, he is an ex-UPC preacher. But we can condemn UPC people for their teaching if the teaching is against the word of God. I'm telling you, folks, I, I don't really, I don't teach much on, on, on Sunday about on doctrine because Sunday there's, you know, too many new people and they really won't understand. I mean, of course, I teach on doctrine all the time, I'm preaching. But I'm telling you, when you study this, when you begin to look deeper into the revelation of one God, we're not afraid to ask questions. We're not afraid to scrutinize uh, teachings. But we want to be honest with what the Bible teaches us. And this is a revelation. There is only one God. One God and one mediator between God and man. The man, Christ Jesus. He was fully man who died on the cross for us. Was resurrected as God. The Son of God resurrected. It is, it is a mystery. But it's not a, a couple of different people. It's not Arianism. It's not Trinitarianism. It's one, the oneness of God. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. Thank you for this understanding in your word. We thank you for your revelation. And Lord, the simplicity of scripture, Lord. While we don't understand all of the mechanics and the workings behind how you had uh, been manifest in flesh, how you became flesh, yet we know it is the one true God still who became flesh. You didn't send another God. You didn't send a Jehovah Junior but you became flesh and dwelt among us. And so, Lord God, with this understanding, Lord, we also know that your word says that to whom much is given, much is required. We have been given an incredible revelation. But with that revelation, Lord, we have a responsibility, Lord God, to reach more people that we can, to teach the truth of your word. You said to make disciples or to teach all nations, baptizing them in the name singular, of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That name is Jesus Christ and to teach them again to observe all things. So we pray, Lord, that you bless everyone that's here. Thank you for all that have made the effort. Lord, I ask you to go with us. Let your hand rest upon us. Cause your anointing to flow through us, Lord, to be witnesses at work, at home, at school, wherever we are and cause us to experience your blessings. We give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God.